if we have gotten to the place in our lives where we don't expect anything to happen, then for all intents and purposes, we are living like an atheist. If we have gotten to the place in our lives when we no longer expect anything to happen, then for all intents and purposes, we are living with, like an atheist towards the resurrection of Jesus Christ. For the resurrection of Jesus Christ, we've just heard in the gospel, means that Christ, even though he has gone away from us in the body, he has sent the Holy Spirit, the advocate, the one who walks beside us always, the one who was in our hearts. He has sent his own helper to be within our hearts. And that means that the resurrection, the belief in the resurrection, always brings us to a crisis. And a crisis is just a way of saying uh, we need to make a decision. That's what the word crisis event originally meant in Greek. It brings us to a decision and to a crisis. If we really believe in the resurrection of Christ and that God has put within our hearts an advocate, a helper, a comforter who is always with us, then that brings us to the crisis of not simply do we believe that God can raise a person from the dead 2,000 years ago, but it brings us to the place right now where we have to decide, can I open my heart and my mind enough to make room for the Holy Spirit of God who can always make something happen that I didn't expect and that I didn't give permission for and that I can't control. Because we are, we're faced with this crisis when we're given the advocate, the Holy Spirit of God to be within us. Are we going to use the, because that spirit is full of power, the power of God, but it's a power that's different than the power of this world. And how will we open ourselves to the power from God? Because the power of this world so often is all about shutting down and closing down and locking up and freezing assets and freezing resources so that nothing more can happen. So that nothing will happen. And people in power almost always have an They've almost always got a secret agenda. Nothing should happen because it will disturb the people who have the power. But if we believe in the resurrection of Jesus Christ and of the advocate who is sent to live within us and among us, something can always happen. Something can always happen that we didn't expect and we don't have any control over. It can happen in our hearts, it can happen in our families, it can happen in our parish, it can happen in our city, it can happen in our world. We don't control the Holy Spirit. And so we're always faced with a crisis as Christians when we're faced with the resurrection and the advocate who lives within us. Because what we'd like to do is this, what our tendency is probably like this. We get a couple of things. Let's say we get three things that we're really good at. Well, I'm really good at that. And I've gotten really good at that, and I've gotten, so you know what, I'm just going to do those things I'm really good at. So I'm just going to go around that circle there, and I'm going to do that, and I'm going to do that thing, and I'm going to do that, and I'll just go around that circle, and I'll just keep going around that circle, because I look really good, because I got, a, I got this down, so I look really good when I do that, and I do that, and, I'm doing, and I don't have to ever do anything else, because I got these down, and I look really good. And that's despair. That doesn't look like despair. But that's despair. And it's not the kind of despair of an emotional turmoil and depression that may, you know, might want us to consider. It's not that kind of despair. But it's a kind of despair of the Spirit of God. Because what it says is that I'm going to suppress the Spirit of God and the Spirit of wonder who always asks more questions, who always wants to do better, who always wants me to learn, who always, and when, and when I don't want to, when I get tired and I don't want to be a person of integrity anymore, that Spirit always wants to fight for greater integrity. And it says, I'm going to suppress that so that I don't have to learn, because learning is humiliation. I don't want to have to be a person who, who, who makes mistakes in front of people. You can tell why I like this, right? Cause, cause. 
I don't want to be the kind of person who has to make mistakes again and be humble. And it's a, it's a kind of despair because it believes that learning is humiliation. Of making mistakes and being humble and having to start again and having to learn again and not getting it right the first time but getting better the second time and then making more mistakes and getting better the third time. And, and it doesn't want to learn anything new. It wants to stop learning. It wants to refuse to learn. And it just wants to look good doing the same three things over and over and over. That's despair. That's a kind of despair of the Spirit of God. Because it says there's no room for new life. There's no room for the Spirit of God to do anything new. And I would rather not, I'd rather have certainty about three things than have a bunch of new questions about ten things and have to learn again, have to become a child and learn again before God. So believing in the resurrection of Jesus Christ Believing in the advocate that he sends to us means, among many, many other things, it always means something could happen. Something could happen. It could happen here in this parish. It could happen in our families. It could even happen to us. I'd like to invite Gary Fitzgerald to please come forward at this time. Gary is our, I've forgotten your title, Gary. What is your exact title? It's a very big title. Well, I'm just the no, but you are the official witness to the annual Catholic appeal. You don't get any money for that, but you've got a big title. So. <laughs> All right. But. Well, as uh, Father Jerry told you, my name is Gary Fitzgerald, and I was fortunate enough to be asked by Kevin Lovejoy to give this year's annual Catholic Appeal witness speech. I've been a parishioner here at St. Pat's for almost 25 years, and I'm a family physician and also practice in preventive medicine, and for the past 20 years, I've commuted between our home in Lake Bay and Loma Linda University Medical Center in California. Um, a lot of miles on Alaska Airlines, but whenever I would come back on the weekends and come here to St. Pat's, I really felt I was at home. While I was traveling each week, my wife Kathleen kept the home fires burning, and although Kathleen is not Catholic, she has had the opportunity to share many wonderful experiences with St. Patrick and its ex St. Patrick's and its exceptional people here. Um, I was born and raised in a strong Irish Catholic family in Boston, Massachusetts, and I learned at a very young age not only the faith-based commitments of being Catholic, going to Mass every Sunday and Holy Day, saying your prayers every day, not eating meat on Fridays in those days, but also the social commitments of being Catholic, which included in our family supporting church functions, helping those with more needs than we had, and also helping out financially. And at age six, when I received my first allowance, my dad sat me down and he said, you know, with an allowance not only comes the opportunity to have a good time, but the responsibility to help others. So we decided that a nickel of my allowance each week would go to help support Catholic charities that my family supported. And then I would actually have a say in what some of those charities might be and actually get an opportunity to go with my dad and family to see some of those charities at work so that I could see how my nickel was helping out. Um, I have a friend, Leland Kaiser, who is a health care consultant. And Leland goes into different health care organizations and works with them to introduce more compassion and spirituality. And Leland says when he goes into an organization, he doesn't look at their mission statement first. He looks at their checkbook because where they spend their money tells him more about their priorities and mission than anything that he may see in that mission statement. And I think that's a very good point. I think if you look at the annual Catholic Appeal dollars and where they go, 
it's pretty amazing. And I think it says volumes about where their priorities really lie. Ninety-three percent of the dollars that go into the annual Catholic Appeal go to support over 60 ministries in Western Washington and also for rebates back to the parishes within our archdiocese. Um, that's a pretty amazing amount of money to put back from what is raised. I think that's, that's pretty spectacular. Um, I think that it's really important to support the annual Catholic appeal because it's more about being Catholic and understanding that we're part of a universal church. And I've had the opportunity to see firsthand some of the wonderful things that come from the support we give to the annual Catholic appeal. Um, I have some friends out on the Key Peninsula who, although in their 60s, decided that they were going to take on the responsibility of raising a verily mentally disturbed young adolescent who had already had several suicide attempts. And they really didn't know where to turn. And although they're not Catholic, somebody recommended that they, re that they contact uh, Catholic Community Services for help. And they did. And for the past six months, Catholic Community Services has sent a counselor to their home all the way out on the Key Peninsula to work with them to help create a loving and supportive environment for this young man. Now, obviously, this is not the end of the story, and there's still a lot of issues that have to be dealt with. But for the first time in years, this young man is on a healing and loving journey that may lead him to opportunities that we can't imagine. As Father Jerry said, his life has opened up a little bit more. And it's each and every one of us that has helped this young man. And who knows what he will actually be able to achieve with God's help and with our support. So I think services like that are critical. Uh, many of you probably knew Jack Enright. Jack and I used to sit uh, over on the right side of the church. Jack was a parishioner here at St. Pat's for 99 years. He led a remarkable life. He was baptized here at St. Pat's, married here at St. Pat's, and had his funeral here at St. Pat's several months ago. Matter of fact, his son is in the uh, audience here today. And Jack, during his last months of life, uh, wanted to stay at home with his 98-year-old wife and his caregiver daughter. And it was community health services and their home health care workers that enabled Jack to do that. And what a wonderful opportunity for a committed parishioner to be able to spend his last days in the loving and caring environment of his own home and to have people like our uh, people here at St. Pat's coming to visit and bringing him the Eucharist. I think those are the kinds of things that are important for us to understand that annual Catholic appeal supports. So each and every one of us really helped Jack stay in that loving and caring environment. And I think that's a very important part. Um, the annual Catholic appeal, as I mentioned, is really about being Catholic and about understanding that we're part of a universal church. And as a universal church, we have deacons and priests to train, we have schools to build and support, we have the needy to look to, we also have to recognize that the nuns and priests that we've worked with for so many years and have given so many of their life uh, services to the Catholic faith uh, are important to help in their retirement also. I mean, just look at what uh, the ability to have Deacon Bill here in this parish has been, uh, especially with all the changes going on. I believe that if the only thing we ever got out of the annual Catholic appeal is Deacon Bill would be far ahead of the game. Uh, in this year of mercy, I think we have a real opportunity to show our love by our commitment to the uh, Catholic appeal. St. Augustine says, what does love look like? It has the hands to help others. It has the feet to hasten to the poor and needy. It has eyes to see misery and want. It has ears to hear the sighs and sorrows of men. That is what love looks like. And so again, this is our opportunity in this year of mercy to show how our love works through the annual Catholic appeal. And today when I see what our church does, it not only makes me feel good, but it makes me feel proud to be a Catholic. I, along with our Jesuit priests, Deacon Bill and Kevin Lovejoy, 
and all the amazing staff here at St. Pat's. Thank all of you for your past generosity to the ACA in this parish and look forward to an even greater level of support in the year to come. St. Patrick's is our home, Catholicism our faith, and love our guiding principle. And the choice to make a difference in the world is truly ours. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Kevin Lovejoy to give you the particulars on how we can support the ACA. Kevin? Thank you so much, Gary, for your uplifting remarks, not only about the annual Catholic appeal, but also for sharing your personal story here with the parishioners of St. Patrick's. It's also great to see how our contributions to the annual Catholic appeal uh, support programs that impact real lives of real people. And they also serve as a reminder, again, that we are part of a bigger church, 175 church communities in Western Washington that really do need to work together to collectively support each other and reach out to those most needy in the world as our faith calls us to do. I just want to take a few minutes real quick here to walk us through the nuts and bolts of how to participate in this year's campaign. In just a minute, I'll ask Bob McCamey to play some music for us so you can consider your gift today. I also want to thank the 60 people already who have uh, given uh, and contributed to the annual Catholic Appeal. <laughs> in years past, um, the kickoff of this campaign coincided with Father Seamus's departure to Ireland for an extended family vacation. And he would um, urge, urge us to complete that campaign while he was gone. This was not his favorite campaign. Um, and as you know, many of you know, that rarely happened, that we achieved the goal while he was gone, and it would continue on for quite some time. So it's my sincere hope that uh, under this new leadership model we have here, that, and with everybody's help, um, we can change that practice and reach our goal, hopefully by the end of May this year. Um, but it takes your help, and here's how you can help. It's really simple. We just ask you to take a few minutes while you're thinking about it to fill out the pledge form. I think so many of us, like many of us, we say to ourselves, I'll get to it, I'll get to it, just put it over there. And then we get distracted, and I think you know the rest of the story. <clears throat> so let's think about it right now. There really is no time like the present. While Gary's remarks are fresh in our minds, and the pledge cards are right here in the pews. So they're very simple to fill out. If you look in there, they're, they're there in the pews here now today. You can make a one-time gift or a monthly pledge that can be charged to your credit card or your debit card or an automatic bank transfer or paid by a check. For some of you more tech-savvy people out there in the pews today, a more convenient and efficient way to participate is through your smartphone. Now, normally, we don't encourage you to do this in church. <laughs> uh, but today, if you'd like to make your pledge, uh, through your phone, please do so. It's very simple. Just click on the QR code or type in the website that's on the pledge card and follow the links to the donate and you can make your pledge today. The goal for our parish is $118,000, but we also have another goal of increasing the number of participants from last year's 434 pledgers to 456, a modest 5% increase. So that means we need some new first-time contributors. And if you've never pledged before or don't know how much to consider giving, it's very simple. You know, think about it, dollar a day, a $365 pledge for the year. In fact, last year, the average pledge was $278. And if you have kids, you might want to consider following Gary's advice and the wisdom of his father uh, with, uh, with giving a nickel of his allowance to the church and consider doing something like that with your children. And if you need additional information, again, on the multitude of services and programs supported by this campaign, please check the website. But of course, we do understand that if your situation is such that right now you can't make a financial contribution, we certainly understand that. But we nevertheless ask you to fill out a pledge card and pledge your prayers in support of the annual Catholic Appeal and all the projects it supports throughout the diocese, because we can never underestimate the power of our prayer. So now at this time, um, I'd like to ask Bob, if you would, uh, to play some music here, and I'd ask you to take a few minutes to prayerfully consider your pledge to the annual Catholic Appeal, and uh, during the collection, you can place your pledge card in the collection basket. Thank you very much. <laughs> 